Welcome to another episode of the Atlas Solutions Podcast. My name's Brian. He's Chad. Today, we're going to take you through some Apple news and a product review. Hey, Chad, how's it going? Hey, it's going great. So I've had a couple requests to talk about family sharing. And in particular, I want to dive in a little bit to um, aging out. So I've had actually two moms in the past few months come to me and say, you know, I had family sharing set up and then my son turned 13 and all of a sudden we found that he was downloading Instagram on his iPhone or, or some other app that was, uh, you know, as a family decided we're not going to download that app. So I want to kind of roll back and talk about what is family sharing a little bit and talk about why that age out happens. Um, so Legally, in when we've done iPad rollouts and iPhone rollouts and stuff in schools, um, children are not allowed to go and just get an Apple ID because there's content on the App Store that uh, they shouldn't see. So Apple sets an age limit. Well, of course, you can just lie and you can make up whatever age, but then you know Apple's not liable because you said you were 100 years old so uh, right. and you were 10. So family sharing is supposed to kind of help us with that, to be able to control a little bit at just the base level, what our kids can and can't do. And, but it also kind of gives us the plus of being able to share content that we have and we've purchased together. So we're not buying the same apps and the same subscriptions over and over again. So I'll just flip over here and we'll take a look at my Mac. You can do this on your iPhone as well, but right up here, this is a big Sur um, Mac here. So up in the top, I've logged into my Apple ID and I'm going to click on family sharing and I pretty much have everything shared out. And of course you can set the organizer and you can set the parent and the guardian. So you can send a request to your wife or, or whoever, and they can become a parent or guardian, basically a decision maker. And then as you can see, like we share our Apple TV subscription and uh, I'm signed up for Apple one. And just to kind of show you, Apple One is like all of this stuff. So you get Apple Music as a family, Apple Arcade, uh, Apple News, um, location sharing, uh, purchase sharing. So if, again, like I said, if you buy an app, you can share it um, to your family. And of course, I like this one as well as the iCloud storage. So if you're, if you're putting your photos in the cloud... Um, it's going to show you how much you're used there. So uh, I've got, I think in the the iCloud One, you get two terabytes, or Apple One, you get two terabytes of storage, which is great. Especially when you have multiple family members, you can share up to six family members, as you see there in that storage plan. Now, the problem is what happens when... Uh, your kid ages out, but I want to kind of explain, well, what are they? Why is their Apple ID different and how do they get the option? So an Apple ID is named exactly the way it is. It's an, it, a lot of people think of it as an email address, but it's really your identifier behind the scenes. We don't see that ID. So you think about my name's Chad, but I have a social security number. You know, I could go and get my name changed. I don't know if I could get my social security number changed, the, your Apple ID is like your social security number. So if you're a minor, if you're under 13, so in a school system, and we want to be able to leverage an Apple ID. So, you know, I want the 10 year old to have an app to be able to learn and do these games or whatever. We would do a setup, you know, with an MDM and a, a, a complicated setup where we would set the child up with a managed Apple ID. So a managed Apple ID is essentially like half of an Apple ID. It's not doesn't have all the power. It can't go and buy apps and do its all thing. It's, it's managed by somebody. In the enterprise or in the education, we use managed apps to be able to you know, delegate a child an Apple ID, and then we can give them the apps that we want them to have, and we can take them away. We can you know, kind of make the choices for them, but then they can still have the app on their iPad or their iPhone or whatever. When you're doing family sharing, you're basically doing a, the small version of that. Instead of 100 kids or 1,000 kids, you have just your family. I don't have my children connected yet because they're just too young. <laughs> but um, it, do. do you? So yes, I do. When you, when you um, set them up, 
they can have their own Apple ID. They can have their own calendar. They have all their own stuff. So that way you don't have, you know, Winnie the Pooh's birthday showing up on your calendar for you and your wife. Like, you know, whatever you, the kids can have kind of their own ecosystem, but you've got control. You can do the purchasing for them. You can do, uh, you know, I want to buy this app, dad. Okay. Well, let me take a look at it first and then you can select to buy it for them and, and that sort of thing. So you kind of have like the, where we would, roll out all these tools to manage a school um, or, you know, an enterprise environment, you have the same environment, but it's just a small family. So, so Brian, what's kind of your experience? You've got family sharing turned on. What's it, uh, how's it helped or harmed your family so far? Um, I'd say family sharing has been, you know, and my kids are also very young, but they're using old devices and that's how we're managing life in the pandemic a little bit is, you know, they'll get a little screen time in the afternoon or whatever yeah. on some iPads. Um, but what, what I've noticed, you know, they're, and they're, you know, they're four and seven, so they're little, you know, they're pretty, still pretty young, Yeah. but the, they still have to ask permission for everything at this age. Sure. You know? um, and, you know, the, I think the greatest thing in this family sharing ecosystem is the screen time settings. Yep. Because, you know, you talked about as you, age out or get older you can um get access to more apps the screen time functionality has to become your parenting tool i think at that point because up to up until 18 you can still say well maybe i don't want you to have instagram so i want i can still block it from being used you can go download it but you don't get more than 10 minutes a day or something like that you can you have some control there uh, so it's been interesting you know and the kids will you know and i give them about two hours a day or it depends on what I'm using for school. So she gets a little extra. Yeah. You can be very granular there with how that's, um, what, what they get, I guess. For sure. And I think this is the beginning of the way these tools are going to work out. Uh, in last week's podcast, we talked about the Facebook privacy and Apple. And, you know, these are crazy times. We don't know what information these companies have on us. We don't know who's talking to our kids. I mean, I know... Um, there's attempts from all sides to try to try to integrate children into the technology. And I think it's good, but we still need to kind of monitor it a little bit. And this gives us a little bit of control over how much time, what apps they get, are they appropriate? Um, it's still not quite there though. You know, there's still like with Facebook messenger for kids, they can kind of chat with their friends, but you can't really as a parent kind of look and see what they're talking about. And, and it get, you know, there's debates on that. People say, let them do whatever they're going to do it anyway. There's people that want to hold them back and restrict them so hard that they go totally crazy when they get let loose. You know, and again, um, one of the experiences that I've heard from parents is, uh, especially for boys, they turn 13 and they don't come and ask for Instagram. They just download it and they start, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's tied. I mean, I think that would still be tied to my credit card. Yeah, so I'm gonna start, you'll start seeing those charges if you're if you're set up as a family. Everything gets purchased through one account. Uh, <clears throat> so you have to protect yourself. If you have a 13 year old, you may want to go set up some of those screen time limits. I think to regulate, it, it could totally catch you off guard. You know, you're seeing all these news articles about a kid getting a hold of something and buying. Yes, uh, you know, yeah. thousand dollars in doll houses or whatever. <laughs> something <laughs> ridiculous. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah, they've built some protection in there for you. Um, like I've asked to buy, I think turned on for everybody. I'm looking at it now. Yeah, the kids have to ask, and you know, I'll get a a ping and I'll say, "Hey, she, you know, she wants to do this." And I say, "Yes or no?" Or, "Hey, let me see that." Um, just an interesting little aside with the screen time thing. Uh, if you have screen time turned on, Netflix and Amazon Prime don't work at all because mm. they just aren't going to play with the restrictions of that. Or I think it was yeah. content restrictions. You have content restrictions turned on. You just can't use Netflix at all. Or, or Amazon yeah. Prime. Well, and that's something I wanted to address is these settings. Um, just it, it's a balance of trying to find security for yourself and the way the internet works with SSL and encryption and all that stuff. And then trying to protect what your, your kid's doing. So we have to have the transparency to be able to see what they're doing uh, but we're limited on what we can see because of the security that's just innately built into the technology. So a lot of people get confused when we talk about MDMs or, or um, you know, family sharing or, or different ways to kind of monitor what's going on. 
there's not a real good way to track like what websites kids are going to, what they're, how much time they're spending on these websites because it's all encrypted. Um, more and more as the days go forward in business, when we're tracking website traffic, um, just on a on a basic level, we're going to see you know a little bit of Facebook and YouTube or whatever, and then the rest of it is just private data, which is the mass majority because it's all encrypted. It's not supposed to be known. And the only devices that have the ability to kind of rip open those traffic packets and investigate what's what's this person looking at, very, very expensive, um, not easily implemented, at least today. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Nothing can replace good parenting. Sometimes you just got to get the device and look, talk to the kids, educate them. They're going to run into stuff. Um, and we've got some more episodes coming in the future that we're planning on doing about you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, there's a website code um, called Omegle that Abigail and I've talked about, which is super scary where you're just instantly dropped into a video chat with a total stranger, you know, and these kids have access to it. There's no restrictions. There's no way to know that what they're doing, who they're talking to. So you've got a parent, you got to look out, um, and be there for them. I think there's, you just can't replace that. So, um, in today's ver- uh, episode of Is It Worth It, we're going to talk about the iPhone 12. So, we both have the iPhone 12. I have the iPhone 12 Pro Max. And yeah, I have the iPhone 12 Pro regular. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's an interesting... Uh, I actually wanted to ask you about that. So, I got the Max when I went to the 11. And I think before we even started, when we decided to talk about the iPhone 12, the the is it worth it question is, well, it depends on what you have. Um, you were going from what phone? Uh, the 10. Okay, so you went from the 10. X. 10 X. <laughs> yeah, the X. <laughs> the X. What do you want to call it? Is it? Had an X. Yeah. It's the 10, you know, yeah. That's so I actually had the 11 Pro Max, um, and my dad was in need of an iPhone, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and upgrade and I'm going to, you know, give my dad my old phone and that way he'll start on a, a like a pretty good phone rather than go buy one or whatever. So, uh, I went from 11 pro max to 12 pro max. Uh, for me, I don't know that it was necessarily worth it. There's not a drastic improvement, but I did want to get into the five G world. Okay. Um, I don't know that I've seen a drastic difference. We're a couple months in. I've had it since, I guess, uh, I think I got mine in September, October. Uh, and, you know, it's, I see the 5G. Do it, Can I tell a drastic difference? No. Um, now, you're a little closer to Uptown. What's your 5G experience been so far? Well, I'm also on a different carrier. So, I don't, I'm on AT&T. I know you're on Verizon. I'm on right? Verizon, so, yep. Uh I don't know that AT&T has any 5G, or they didn't. I haven't looked since the iPhone came out in, what, September, October. Yeah. I don't think they've made any. You can't get it here. <laughs> it's, it's not. Yeah. That's, I think that's the thing about 5G is it's not everywhere yet. It's great if you're living in maybe San Francisco or New York City or some big city that's already got it rolled out, one of these major hotspots. Um, but it hasn't really rolled out to enough places to make it a, it's not an accessible technology. Well, um, my neighbor, it works for Verizon and he is one of the guys that deploys the towers for 5g specifically. So, um, his observation is number one thing you have to understand about 5g with, without getting too technical is that it's what we call line of sight. You have to actually see the tower or else you're not going to get the speed. So now in in uh, his estimation, and he showed me the statistics on his 5G, I think he's got some sort of a Samsung phone. He's getting two gig down, which is just incredible. I mean, those wow. speeds are absolutely incredible on a cell phone. But he's standing at the tower. You know, he's he's within yards of this tower. So unlike kind of the cell signal that we currently have, 4G and even 3G, we're talking exponential changes in speed. So uh, 2G speeds back in the original iPhone days was 0.1 megabit per second, which if you don't know what that means, it's really slow. It's basically (laughs) doesn't work. Yeah. 3G 
That's what it is. Yeah. It, it, 3G is the equivalent of about 8 megabit per second. So in your kind of regular internet terms, that's not great internet. That's like really slow DSL. It's bad DSL. It's bad that. DSL. Now, when we talk about 4G, which is what the world has kind of been on for the past several years, we're talking up to 60 megabits. So you go from 8 to 60, um, and that's like a pretty pretty nice jump. But when you go from 4G to 5G, it's from maximum 60 to 1,000. So it's literally exponential. And again, from what my neighbor's saying, you can even get double that. He's on some... In, perfect circumstance you're going to get two gigabit per second um what that's going to do is it's going to allow phones and computers to be able to download extremely large content higher quality video whatever at a faster speed in the future but we physically have to build that out before it's ever going to be worthwhile to your common person so is the iphone 12 worth it (sighs) I think, uh, I hate to say it, but it depends. It does depend yeah. again. <laughs> Don't get it for 5G because there's yeah. not enough of that out there. If that's your reason for upgrading, don't upgrade. <laughs> exactly. If you got a three-year-old phone, four-year-old phone like I did, yeah, it's great. Um, but, you know, I think iPhones in general, this is kind of a broader topic, have gotten so good and the features stay in there for so long and they're so useful for so long. Unless you're just a super nerd like me and you like you me <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to get it you know unless you just really gotta have the latest and greatest but you're not getting that much more yeah on a year-to-year basis from a uh, technology because you know i'm thinking about how exciting it was back in like the iphone four days and yeah. iphone five days like you'd get a phone and there'd be something that was just like magical about it yes Maybe it's using the device for so long, but the, the new iPhone is just an iPhone. Like, there's a few new things in it, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a tool and it still does what it's done before. You know, I like the extra camera personally. Yep. Uh, the, thir- the third camera on the, on the pro line, because uh, I like that telephoto, but everything else, you know, and the wireless charging is nice. I think, I think my old phone had that. I don't remember. I didn't use it, <laughs> but. You know, I, I do want to say uh, the negative review I have of the iPhone 12 so far, and I have yet to figure out where this problem comes in, but um, I switched over to wireless charging on the iPhone 11. Uh, I believe it worked on the 10. It was pretty slow adoption. Uh, you've got to be careful because if you're in Target and you get one of these wireless chargers that's just sitting there at the next to the candy bars for 10 bucks. I, I literally saw when the recommendation was, well, you can use this, but you also have to plug it in. It's such a low voltage. It's just going to take forever. It's like barely holding it, a charge with the thing. So you got to get a good one. The new iPhone 12 has the magnet on the back. So it's, you're going to magnetically connect your charger right to the device. But you know, I may need to do another review of this, but I have the hard cider labs, um, charging pad that does the uh, apple watch and the phone you can actually do two phones and the apple watch and your airpods whatever great concept yeah, yeah. It, um it works about 50 percent of the time which is terrible mm-hmm. i mean my phone right now last night i went to bed threw it on there and i always check it does a little vibrate whenever it connects and say you say okay i think it's connected here uh, rather than you plug it in you know it's plugged in um about 50% of the time I wake up and my phone's dead or, or almost dead. Luckily the iPhone 12 has an awesome battery. So it's not actually dead. A lot of times it's just super low. Um, so I've noticed several times with the iPhone 12, I have to reboot for it to charge wirelessly again, which is just not great. I mean, I'm talking you're connected with the magnetic charger or the wireless charger, either one you're plugged in. It connects and it does not charge. I don't know if it's a software thing. I mean, we're, we just got released 14.4. So, yeah, um, yeah I downloaded this morning. I have not had any issues with wireless charging on mine. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't have know. MagSafe, though. I use, I'm a big fan of Anchor uh, products. So, I, I use all their batteries. I have two of just the discs. Little, they're not super expensive. Um, I have a couple of those that I use for charging 
just phones around the house and you have to line them up just right. That's the difference sure. between MagSafe and these is you have to make sure they're in the right spot and you see the little blue light come on. So you know something's happening and you see the charge. Like, you want to stop and look at it and go, okay, I see the phone charging. I see the light on. I can walk away now. Yes. <laughs> so you know it's happening. Uh, but yeah, that's something issues? to, you got to check it. Um, you know, it's still pretty uh, premature, the wireless charging. It's good. I mean, I haven't plugged my phone in. I've probably plugged this iPhone 12 in maybe twice since I've bought it. Most of it's wireless charging. But yeah, I mean, you can really get stuck if you're in a hurry and you wake up and your iPhone's dead or something. So just be watching out. I'm, um, I'll let you guys know more, obviously, when we find out. If it's a software thing, is it the iPhone 12 Pro, the Max? Is it? We don't know yet. So um, I haven't read many forums on it, but that's definitely a negative in my mind. But yeah, going back to is it worth it? 5G, no. Wireless charging, no. But if you have an older phone, there is sort of a, a, a metric you need to consider, which is what's the resale value of your current phone? So mm. if if I resell my 11, my 11 Pro was worth, you know, seven or 800 bucks still. It's a perfectly good phone. It's got a case. Right. If I wait one more year... And there's the iPhone 13. Now you're two gen behind, and it it doesn't just cut it in half. You're probably about 20 percent at that point. Then your phone's probably worth 200 bucks instead of five or six or seven or 800 dollars versus you know your original purchase price. So there is that to consider. If you're on one of these recycle plans, you're paying monthly for it, or what? You know, that's kind of the idea is that you can just upgrade and continue paying forever and get it's the like latest Apple subscription. Thing. That's essentially that's essentially what it is. Yeah, so, I, I, I pay do it the Apple financing thing, and it's like fifty bucks a month for my phone. Yeah, and I think if I want to upgrade, I can upgrade. If I don't, like the last one, I did that, and I paid for it for two years, and then I didn't pay for it for a year, so hmm. it was paid for, and I feel like. I still, I might have got a two hundred dollar credit when I traded it in. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So, leave in the comments. Uh, do you have an iPhone twelve? Is it worth it? Have you noticed a big difference? Has your five G experience been good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you guys next time. Right. Bye, guys.